So, oh yes, I didn't do the domain arrays. Okay, so domain of this one, we shifted it left one unit, so instead of it being greater than or equal to zero, it's going to be greater than or equal to negative one. The range, we shifted up one unit, so instead of being y is greater than or equal to zero, it's going to be y is greater than or equal to positive one. Yeah, you can find the domain and range from the equation. So let me do that with this next one. Okay, so just looking at the equation, before I even graph it, I can tell you that the domain of this is going to be x is greater than or equal to positive 1 because we've got minus 1 under the square root, so that's going to move us opposite of what we expect, so that's going to move it right one unit. And the range is going to be y is greater than or equal to negative 2. Because we have minus 2 on the end, that moves what you expect up and down, so it goes down two units. So without even graphing it, I can go ahead and tell you what the domain and range are going to be. So let's, let's graph it. Okay, normally, square root of x, just the plane of square root of x starts at the origin. But we move down two units, so now we're at 0, negative 2, and we move right one unit, so we're at 1, negative 2. That's where it starts, so that agrees with our domain and range. And then the first point is always up 1 over 1, and then we go up 1 over 2, and we don't have room to put another like whole number point on there. You could put some decimals. If you filled in the table, you would get some decimal values. Yep. Yeah, pretty much. If you can draw the person, if you can draw the origin point and the next two, then I am satisfied with that. Put your curve in there, you're good to go. No, you don't have to worry about that. No, I just I did that on number seven, uh, just to point out the whole domain issue. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It would have an error at zero. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, so I I don't make you like on on a quiz or a test. I'm not going to make you like fill out the table. Um, the the table here is just to to help point out some things that you need to know about square root functions. Okay. Um, from the second point, you go up one over two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As long as there's nothing multiplied in front of the square root. Okay, that's because if we go back to these, when we were multiplying by something, like number two, uh, number three, number four, when we were multiplying, then that throws it off. But any other time, um, every time it is, go, oh, no, 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 my bad, it's up one over three. My bad. I'm sorry. Up one over three. This point's too close. thought that didn't look right. Uh, up one over three, so it should intersect at five. <clears throat> well, A, you could plug it in. Or B, I'm going back to the very original. changing that relationship, we're just taking the entire graph and we're shifting it either up or down, we're just taking that piece and moving it around. So the same relationship exists from point to point, it's just the position that differs. So, yeah, so the point should be at 5. And I can check that. Um, plug in, if I plug in 4, 4 minus 1 is 3, the square root of 3 minus 2 is not 0. And uh, I have that in place. It's actually 5. Now, again, there's absolutely nothing wrong with creating your table and plotting the points. I mean, you can even, guys, you, you can graph this on your calculator, okay? 
I'm just trying to show, especially those of you that are going on to the to the college um, and are going on to my calculus class, like you you've got to know how this works without looking at it on your calculator. Okay, um, you've got to understand these relationships. But there is nothing wrong with doing it this way. I'm just trying to teach it to you from the non-calculator perspective. Whoops, let me fix that. Window. So, I mean, you can see the shape, you can see where it starts, you can see all that on your calculator, and I'm just trying to teach it to you by hand. Okay? Hmm? What? Yeah, you can check it on the calculator, most definitely. Most definitely. Alright, let's look at um, the other common root. We're not going to look at the fourth root and the fifth root, but you do need to be also familiar with the cube root, okay, and what its graph looks like. Now, notice. For these tables, I have negative values, right? Because we don't have that issue with cube roots. You can take the cube root of a negative number. The cube root of negative 8 is negative 2. The cube root of negative 8 is negative 2. So um, we don't have a domain restriction with the cube root functions because we can plug in negative numbers and we will get out an answer. The cube root of negative 4, negative 4 is not a perfect cube. Um, but let's get a decimal approximation here. Uh, negative 1.6-ish. Cube root of negative 2. Negative 1.3. Cube root of negative 1 is negative 1. Cube root of 0 is 0. Cube root of positive 1 is 1. Cube root of positive 2 is going to be positive 1.3-ish. Okay, notice there is some symmetry here. It just differs by that sign. Okay, so the cube root is kind of like, it has an S-shaped kind of thing going on. I mean, it's not really a true S, but um, it kind of curves around here and looks something like this. It gets arrows on both ends because it can keep going, okay? Negative 8 is not the smallest number that we can plug in. Positive 8 is not the biggest number that we can plug in. We can make this graph as big or as small as we need to. So that means our domain is all real numbers, okay? You can plug in any x value and you will get a y value answer. Um, so you can write it using the all real numbers symbol. It's like an R with an extra, I call it an extra back on it. Um, or you can, in uh, interval notation, you put negative infinity to infinity in a set of parentheses. Um, the range is also all real numbers. This graph is going to continue, yes, um, it does not drop off very drastically. So what I mean by that is like, it's not like the arrow is, is pointing down this way, but it will continue to decrease. It's just very, very slowly, but it will continue to decrease. Um, and approach a mean infinity on the left side and a positive infinity on the right side. Okay. Um, similar thing happens when we add something to the outside of this cube root. So now that we've kind of talked about that with the square roots, I'm going to use the same mentality here. I'm just going to play off of what I got in number 11 and shift everything up two units. So instead of the middle being at the origin, it's at 0, 2. And then all my other points are just going to be two units higher than they previously were. So you can fill in the table if you really, really want to, but I'm just going to uh, play off the graph here. And fill in my graph. Now, the cool thing about the cube root function, its domain and range and everything are still 
all real numbers, all the time. The domain and range of cube root functions is always all real numbers. It is never anything else. Okay? Because really the only time your domain and range are going to be affected is if there is for some reason some x value that you can't plug in and get an answer for. You can plug anything into the cube root function and you will get an answer out. Alright, let's look at an example here where we are subtracting 3 inside the radical, inside the cube root. So again, you can fill in the table if you really want to, or you can just use it um, from the translation perspective. Minus 3 under the root means it's going to move right 3. So I'm going to take my normal point, my middle point that was at the origin, I'm going to move it right three units, and then I'm going to adjust all my other points the same way. I'm going to move them right three units. Yes, the original was at the origin, so I moved it right three units, so now it's at, at three, zero. <clears throat> Number 14, instead of adding or subtracting anything, we're multiplying by 2 in front. Oh, the domain and range is always all real numbers. Cube root function is always all real numbers. Always, always, always. Doesn't matter how you've shifted it or translated it. It's always all real numbers. Yes. Because again, you can take the cube root of any number and you will get an answer. And you can get positive and negative values for that answer. Wait, what? Yeah. Right, right. Okay. So when we've got this coefficient in front, okay, 2 times the cube root of x, well, all we're doing is we're multiplying all of our y values by 2, okay? So we're not moving left and right at all, so we're still starting at the origin. But instead of our next point being 1, 1, when we plug in 1, what do we get? We get 2. When we plug in negative 1, cube root of negative 1 is negative 1 times 2, that gives us negative 2, okay? What this is doing is this is multiplying all of our y values by 2. So when we plug in, for example, positive 2, 2 times the cube root of positive 2 gives us 2.5. So when we plug in negative 2, it's going to give us negative 2.5. When we plug in 4... Three point one. We're going to negative four. We're going to get negative three point one. And when we plug in eight, cube root of eight is two. Three times two is four. Okay. So again, we get the same basic shape. This one's just kind of stretched out a bit. It's a little bit taller. It's not quite as compact as the other one. But that still does not change our domain and range. Okay, We can still plug in any x value and we're going to get a y value. 
and we're still going to get the whole gamut of y values. 